Well, good morning, Blooming Grove, and thank you for joining me online yet again. You know, now that summer is winding down and fall is right around the corner, we'll soon start seeing farmers out in their combines harvesting their corn and soybeans and other crops. If you live in a rural community like we do, then even if you're not a farmer, you know that harvest season is upon you because you start getting stuck behind these slow moving combines and tractors and, and other farm equipment on these back country roads that we live on. And you know, harvest time has always been a special time of year. In fact, the psalmist refers to it as the crowning of the year. And it's still a, a joyful season, a joyful time of year to this day. It's, it's the reward for uh, farmers hard labor you know all year long they've planned precisely and worked tirelessly and sacrificed much to be able to see this harvest time arrive you know money has been invested time has been sacrificed and hard work has been done throughout the year plowing planting fertilizing crop dusting and weed killing it's the the hope of harvest that makes sense and purpose of all the, the hard work and dedicated sacrifice. However, for the farmer, the harvest results are not entirely in his own hands. You know, he does what he can and then he has to wait. And depending on uncontrollable factors such as the weather, the harvest will be anywhere from abysmal to abundant. And unsurprisingly, the Bible gets plenty of mileage out of harvest season as a metaphor for myriad spiritual life lessons. You know, the, the Psalms often refer to harvest as a symbol of God's goodness, his bountiful blessing, you know, the fact that he provides for people. Paul uses the notion of planting and harvesting to illustrate death and resurrection. The Apostle Paul also employs harvest imagery to emphasize the importance of investing financially in the kingdom of God when he says, you know, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. And that applies, I, I imagine, to any financial endeavor. This morning, however, I'd like to take a closer look at some of the words of Jesus when he used the harvest as a concise yet compelling metaphor for our mission as believers. Let's take a look at this simple but striking statement. We read in Luke chapter 10, verse 1 and 2, After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them out two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He then told them, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus was preparing to send out 36 teams of two and to, to reach all of the towns and villages that he had yet to visit. And he compares their work and his to a harvest, gathering new believers into his kingdom. And this morning, I'd like to to invite you to join me as I dig into and, and unpack this meaningful metaphor because in it, Jesus highlights three essential ingredients to having an abundant harvest. First, Jesus points to the landscape. As Jesus looks out over the landscape of humanity, he announces to his disciples again in verse 2, the harvest is plentiful. In other words, there are innumerable people on this planet ready and willing to hear and receive the message of salvation, the good news of Jesus Christ. In a, a parallel passage, Jesus elaborates, this is in John chapter 4, verse 35 and following, you know the saying, four months between planting and harvest, but I say, wake up. And look around. The fields are already ripe for harvest. The harvesters are paid good wages, and the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. You know, often when we survey 
the landscape of society. We see a world brimming with cynical skeptics that are hostile or hateful toward Christianity and the message of Christ. But that's not what Jesus saw. I'm sure there was plenty of that in his day. But Jesus saw a bountiful harvest ripe for reaping. He saw spiritually hungry, spiritually seeking men, women, and and children with open hearts who were ready and willing to put their faith in him and receive the gift of eternal life. You know, often when we we think about the mission field, we think of, you know, Africa or Brazil or China or Haiti or, or some other foreign nation or third world country. But notice that Jesus sent his disciples ahead of him. He says in verse 1, to all the towns and places he planned to visit. And Jesus wasn't only concerned with, you know, urban cities or foreign nations. He sent his disciples to every little town and map dot village in Galilee. Palmyra, Illinois, where I'm from, is a mission field ripe for harvest. Girard is a mission field. Modesto, Scottville, Hedick are mission fields. Your workplace is a mission field. Heck, Walmart is a mission field. Everywhere there are people, there is a field waiting to be harvested. And I have to believe that there are more people open and receptive to the message of Jesus than we often realize. According to a couple of studies, one by LifeWay Research and the other by Barner Research, 82% of unchurched people, that is folks that don't go to church, say they would be at least somewhat likely to attend church if invited by a friend. So they would at least consider it. And 25% said that they would be very likely to attend church if invited by a friend. Think about that. That's one in four of your non-Christian friends or or not church-going friends who would be willing to come with you if you invited them. And if you catch them at the right time, there are moments when they might be more open to the gospel or, or receptive to the message of Jesus. Kent R. Hunter, in his book, Moving the Church into Action, says there are certain occasions when people will be more open to Christians that want to share their faith or invite them to church. He says when people move to a new community, for one, they tend to be open to new things. And so if you have new neighbors, that's the perfect time to invite them to church with you or to to spark up some spiritual conversation. Uh, When people are changing jobs or careers, they tend to be open to other changes as well. So that's another good time. When uh, people have visited a certain church in the past, they're more likely to accept an invitation to that church again because they feel a sense of familiarity with it. Um, People who are friends of new believers are often more receptive because they've witnessed positive changes in their their friends, their believing friend. Uh, People who have been helped by the church in some way, you know, maybe the church helped them pay their gas bill or or helped them out with a food pantry. Uh, They're often more open to attending that church. And uh, economic difficulties tend to create a spiritual openness in people. And given the the social and economic upheaval that we have been experiencing as a nation, I'm convinced that there are innumerable people in your life and mine who are open right now to the message of Jesus. Now, they might not accept an invitation to in-person church right now, but they'd be likely to, to be open to a conversation about relying on God during difficult times, or maybe, you know, even watching a a church service online. You know, with so many churches streaming online and people watching YouTube more than ever, it's the perfect time to simply share a link with a a friend that that links to a relevant message um, with a friend that's going through a difficult time. Uh, The point is, as we look out over the landscape of our community and our country, we need to see what Jesus saw. Fields of potential new believers 
ripe for the harvest. And in addition to the landscape, the next essential ingredient in an abundant harvest is the Lord. Notice Jesus' words again. He says in verse 2, The harvest is plentiful, therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest. You know, farmers often tend to be people of prayer. You know, in fact, there's a popular poem by Robin Fogle uh, you can find on plaques and other home decor known as the Farmer's Prayer. It reads, Lord, bless the land you've given me, and may I always know, as I tend each crop and creature, you're the one who helps them grow. Grant me strength and wisdom. Please protect me from harm. And thank you for your gracious gift, the blessing of a farm. And farmers pray for rain, they pray for a good crop, all sorts of things, because they know that no matter how hard they work, even if they do all the things right, there are many factors that are ultimately in God's hands, not their own. They recognize that God is the Lord of the harvest. And what's true of planting is true of people too. Again, comparing the gospel to planting and harvesting, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, I planted the seed in your hearts, and Apollos watered it, but it was God who made it grow. God is the Lord of the harvest. It's the, the harvest field, it's his harvest field, and he's the one that makes it grow. So the best thing that you and I can do to ensure a bountiful harvest is to pray to the Lord of the harvest. You know, Paul told the Christians in Philippi to pray about everything in Philippians 4, 6. He told the Christians in Thessalonica, never stop praying in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. And that's how Jesus lived his life. He prayed about everything and he never stopped praying. In fact, he kept praying right up until his final breath on the cross for spiritually confused people. He prayed in Luke 23, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Lee Strobel once shared a, a powerful story about prayer. One day, Lee was about to baptize this woman during a church service at Willow Creek Community Church, and he asked her, have you received Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And she smiled and said, oh, yes, I have. And then he did something unusual. He turned to her husband, who happened to be there, and he said, have you received Jesus as your Savior? And the man stared at Lee for a moment and then just burst into tears. He said, no, I haven't, but I want to right now. And so right there in front of thousands of people, that man confessed his sins, accepted Christ, and Lee baptized the two of them together. Now, after church, a woman came running up to Lee and she threw her arms around him and she was shouting, nine years, nine years, nine years. And Lee Strobel's like, who are you and what, what does nine years mean? And the lady explained, that man that you just baptized is my brother and I have been praying for him for nine long years without even a hint of spiritual interest. But look what God has done today. Now, there's a woman who is glad she didn't stop praying after eight years, right? And some people have been praying far longer than that. There's a, a wonderful lady in our church, Linda, who just shared a couple of weeks ago that she has been praying for 40 years for her mom, who just got baptized two weeks ago at the age of 86. Isn't that incredible? Now, I'll admit that I don't know everything about how prayer works, but I'm just naive enough to believe James when he says that the prayers of the righteous are powerful and effective. Mother Teresa put it this way. She said, when I pray, coincidences happen. When I stop, they don't. Let me encourage you to make a list of all the people in your life who don't know Jesus, who don't have that gift of eternal life, and start praying for them. Pray often, pray hard, and don't give up. And while you're at it, pray that God will use you as a laborer 
in his field. The last essential ingredient in a bountiful harvest is the laborers. While praying for people's salvation is certainly implied and important, Jesus actually instructs his followers to pray specifically for laborers. Let's take one last look at this verse. Jesus says again, verse 10, or verse 2 that is, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. In God's infinite wisdom, he has chosen to make you and me, believers, laborers in his field. In other words, it's our job to bring the message of Christ to an unbelieving world. The Apostle Paul underscores this when he writes in Romans chapter 10, verse 13 and following, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? You know, all too often we think someone is someone else. The reality, however, is that we all live in our own little worlds, our, our own spheres of influence. I don't know all the people that you know, and you don't know all the people that I know. And so in order for everyone to really hear about Jesus, we all have to be the someone who tells them. The Institute for American Church Growth pulled 4,000 churchgoers and asked them how they were influenced to first attend the church where they eventually became members. The results say 2% just walked in. You know, they, they just picked a church and, and walked in randomly. Another 2% came through the church's programs, you know, like something like VBS or something like that. 5% were attracted by the preacher. One percent came out of some special need. Uh, another one percent were reached through visitation programs. Four percent said they came because of the church's Sunday school class. Less than one percent came through a public evangelistic crusade or campaign like a revival. Less than one percent. And 85 percent 85% were converted through the influence of friends and family. They were just invited by their friends. 85%. Isn't that incredible? And the sad truth, though, is that on average, only about 2% of church members actually invite an unchurched person to attend each year. 2%. <laughs> Jesus knew what he was talking about when he said that the laborers are few. I'm reminded of the, the fable of the little red hen. You remember that one? The little red hen finds some seeds, and so she decides to plant them, and eventually the seeds grow into this big wheat field, and then she has to you know, harvest the wheat and then grind it into flour and then bake it into bread. And each step of the way along the process, she stopped and asked her friends, who wants to help me, you know, plant the seeds? Or who wants to help me harvest the wheat, etc., etc.? And every step along the way, all of her friends, the other barnyard animals, all said, not I. Nope, I'm not helping with that. But when she finally said, who wants to help me eat the bread, everybody wanted a slice. And everyone wants the church to grow. You know, we want the lost to be saved. We want the kingdom of God to expand. We all want to live in a world with more sincere followers of Christ. We all want the bread, but so few of us want to do the work. If we want to enjoy the harvest, we all need to chip in and help out. The good news is you don't have to do it alone. Uh, remember what Paul said about his fellow evangelist, Apollos, uh, going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. Paul said, I planted the seed in your hearts, and Apollos watered it, but it was God who made it grow. You know, none of us have to do it all. Sometimes you're, you're just responsible for planting a seed. 
And other times you just have to water it. On, an, on certain occasions, you get to reap the rewards. Jesus put it this way again in John chapter 4, verse 36 and following. He says, What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike? You know the saying, one plants and another harvest, and it's true. I sent you to harvest where you didn't plant. Others had already done the work, and now you will get to gather the harvest. Reaching our non-Christian neighbors, leading people to Christ, is a team effort. By sparking up spiritual conversations, or sharing your testimony, or simply inviting someone to church, you become a link in a chain of interactions that may lead someone to faith in Jesus. But no matter what role you play in the process, all of us, even the angels in heaven, get to rejoice when one lost sinner is saved. If on average only 2% of church members invite an unchurched person this year, let's not settle for average. Let's work together to bring in the harvest. In the coming weeks, if you see farmers out in their combines harvesting their fields, or if you get stuck behind some slow-moving tractor, let it be a reminder to you of the commission Christ gave us as his followers. Let it remind you to, to look out over the landscape and see that the fields are ripe for harvest, that there are spiritually open people all around us in need of a Savior. Let it remind you to pray to the Lord of the harvest. Pray that God would draw more souls to himself and pray that he would send forth laborers, including you and me, into his fields. Pray for opportunities to, to share the gospel and to invite people to church. If we just keep sowing and plowing and watering and reaping, there will be a joyful harvest when the work is done. And listen, if, if you're watching this and you haven't given your life to Christ yet, if you haven't accepted Jesus as your Savior, there is no better time to do that than today. So please reach out to someone. Uh, maybe that's me. You can contact me through email or, or through Facebook or just leave a note in the comment section, whatever you need to do. Or, or reach out to someone close to you that knows Jesus because we would love to walk with you through that process. In the meantime, let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we recognize that you are the Lord of the harvest and that the fields are ripe and ready for harvesting. We pray just as Jesus commanded that you would send forth laborers into your fields. Lord, I pray that you would use each person joining me in prayer right now to share the message of Jesus and bring new believers into your eternal kingdom. We pray in Jesus' powerful name, amen. I wanna thank you again for joining me and I hope that you have a blessed week. I'll see you next Sunday.